I want to introduce Medea, our speaker. We're so honored to have her here. Uh, she's a leading international peace activist. She has master's degrees in public health and in economics. She worked for 10 years as an economist and nutritionist in Latin America and in Africa for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, and the Swedish International Development Agency, as well as the Institute for Food and Development Policy. So she's, she is a leading international peace activist with a lot of expertise about what's happening around the world. Uh, so we're so happy to have her here in Polsko. Uh, so in 1988, she co-founded Global Exchange to promote human rights and social, economic, and environmental justice around the world. And then in 2002, she co-founded uh, the Code Pink, the feminist uh, anti-war group. So she's just been a leading voice. I'm so grateful to her. I've been hearing about her since the beginning of the Iraq war and had friends uh, read me her articles and stuff. So you've been a real inspiration to me personally and I think to many of us in the room. Uh, I just have to tell one story that, or that she, when she was protesting President Obama, uh, she was removed from the room. And after she was removed from the room, President Obama said, the voice of that woman is worth paying attention to. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we're glad to have you. So pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> so it's wonderful being among friends here. I've been on this. Um, I, I think I called it a 50 city book tour, but I think I've gone over 50 cities already um, with this book uh, because I am very worried about where we're going. And being here and getting the morning tour from Kathy to see this base really brings it home and makes it feel like the American people don't know what's happening and where this might be leading us. And the, the narrative that we hear in the media is so astounding. You know, it's um, amazing how with all the different outlets that we think we have, whether it's CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, whatever, there's the same narrative. The same narrative that's going on. And it has really mesmerized and turned the heads of the American people and a lot of our friends. And I don't want to say it in a negative way because I know that it comes from really caring about the Ukrainian people. But I have a lot of friends who are Quakers from birth, uh, Mennonites, people in the peace community who have really felt that this is an exception and that in this case, they are in favor of the US sending weapons. And I wonder, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if that's how you feel, um, but there probably, all of you know somebody who feels that way. And um, so I think it's important that we unpack what is really going on and get back to the core of what brings us to a place like this which is, war is never the answer. War is never the answer. And we have to repeat that to people. War is the problem. Mm -hmm. So there is, as part of the narrative that we hear is constantly talking about this war in Ukraine as unjustified, which it is. It's illegal according to the UN Charter. It's immoral. It's unjustified on so many different levels. But the other adjective is always unprovoked. And that's where we're not hearing the context. Very, very, very rarely do we hear the context of the provocation after provocation after provocation that's been going on for decades coming from the US and the NATO countries. And I hope that you in this room have already looked into some of this, but we go into it in great detail uh, in the book because we think that's the missing piece. If you don't understand the context, you're not gonna understand the solutions. 
And so in that context, to recognize that indeed, when the US broke its promise to Gorbachev in 1991 not to move NATO one inch eastward, that's like the original sin. You know, That's where we go from there to say, you break the promise, you keep expanding, NATO becomes more and more an aggressive military alliance, not a defensive alliance. And we see in those years afterwards how NATO is not only involved in Kosovo, but NATO is involved far from the North Atlantic, getting involved with the United States in the invasion of Afghanistan, in the invasion of Libya. So you have an alliance that is getting more and more aggressive and that is coming closer and closer to Russia's border. Obviously, that is a provocation. I mean, think of it in the US terms. If Mexico decided of its own free volition that it wanted to join an aggressive anti-US military alliance with China or Russia, do you think the US would allow that to happen? Absolutely not. So those who say Ukraine should have the right to join NATO have to think of it in terms of the larger geopolitical questions. Because Russia also does have national security interests that have to be taken into account. So we have that expansion of NATO. And then at the same time, we have the US direct involvement in the internal affairs of Ukraine. Now, come on, we know the US is directly involved in the internal affairs of many countries around the world. This is part of our history. This is part of building up a US empire. This is part of building up US hegemony. This is part of having almost 800 military bases around the world. It is what the US does. We don't want other countries to interfere in our internal affairs. And we shouldn't be meddling in the internal affairs of other countries. And yet, you hear back as far as 2013, Victoria Nuland. Raise your hand if you've heard of Victoria Nuland. We just put out a, a, a Women's Day call from Code Pink to say, fire Victoria Nuland, because we think she has been so problematic in this case. Um, but her. Uh, she was Assistant Secretary of State back in 2013 and bragged about how the U.S. had already invested $5 billion, our tax money, in building up civil society in Ukraine to be against Russia. And so in 2014, when there was an uprising, which started out as a peaceful protest against a government that was democratically elected but was indeed corrupt, and people started coming out to overthrow that government because they wanted a government that was more pro-Western. The US got directly involved. And thank goodness there was a leak of the audio tape of Victoria Nuland talking to the US ambassador to Ukraine at that time, which directly shows how she is manipulating who is going to be the next head of state in Ukraine and who is going to be pushed on the sidelines. And we also have pictures of her out in the uprising in Maidan Square giving out sandwiches and cookies to people. Imagine on January 6th when there was the attempted uprising in the United States, if some official from the Russian government came out and said, here, have some sweets, go in there and overthrow your government. I mean, we laugh, but this is what Victoria Newland was doing. We don't know the full extent of US involvement. And these are the kind of things that we hear 10 years, 20 years later after the, uh, the, uh, uh, the request for federal documents start coming out. Um, but we have enough evidence between the $5 billion, between the leaked audio tape, uh, between uh, Victoria Newland physically being in Maidan Square and knowing the history of our government to understand how much the US was involved in taking out a democratically elected government 
uh, that was not anti-Western, but was also negotiating with the West and with Russia at that time to see what was the best deal that they could get economically, and overthrowing that government and putting in a government that was anti-Russian. That led to the breakaway republics in the Donbass, and that led to Russia taking over Crimea which is important that we talk about because Crimea is very, very important to Russia. I mentioned that the US has 800 military bases around the world. Russia has almost none. But one of the most important ports and bases for Russia is in Crimea. That is where they have the access to the Black Sea. That gives them the access to the Mediterranean. And it is an area that was part of Russia for 200 years. It's an area that has majority ethnic Russians, Russian speakers, just like the Donbass. It is an area that they are not going to give up not without a big, big fight. And now we see Victoria Nuland saying that the US should get involved in helping Ukraine take back Crimea. And I wanted to read to you, since we're in a place that understands the threat of nuclear weapons, what a general who was the advisor to the head of state, uh, Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, at the, uh, during many years of, that she was in power, said about Crimea. He said, this region is as important to the Russians and their Black Sea fleet as the Caribbean or the Panama region is to the United States, or the South China Sea is to China. For strategic reasons, the Russians cannot get out of there. If they were forced to pull out of the Black Sea region by massive Western intervention, they would certainly resort to nuclear weapons. So keep that in mind as we talk about where this is going. So when that uh, civil war started, there was an attempt to come to an agreement. And that was called the Minsk Accords. That was in 2015. Very important because it brought in 1,300 monitors from mostly the European countries it managed to calm down the fighting uh, to a, a, a significant extent. But the Minsk Accords had a political agreement as part of that, which is that Ukraine was supposed to meet with leaders of the breakaway republic and was supposed to give autonomy to that region within the state of Ukraine. That never happened. It never happened for several reasons. One, because any head of state, including Zelensky, who campaigned as a peace president that he was going to implement these peace accords, anytime they tried to do it, they were stopped by the ultranationalists that you can call neo-Nazis. Um, they would say, no way, that belongs to Ukraine. And if you try to negotiate autonomy, you will be hanging from a tree. So no president was able to implement those accords, and also because the West didn't push Ukraine to implement those accords. And you know, as I was writing the book, I was also always wondering, well, why didn't the, the West push them? They knew that this was creating tremendous instability. And lo and behold, just about a month ago, there were two separate interviews that happened, one with Angela Merkel, who was the chancellor in Germany at that time, and one with the person who was the head of France at that time. And they were both the guarantors of this Minsk agreement. And that was Francois Hollande. And guess what? They both said pretty much the same thing. They said the Minsk Accords were an opportunity for us to buy time to build up Ukraine militarily. So it wasn't really a peace accord. It was to buy time. And indeed, how was that time used? It was used to start flooding Ukraine with weapons. This is not new. Under Obama, there were weapons going into Ukraine. He said only defensive weapons. Trump came in and said, what the hell? Let's give them offensive weapons and started flooding the region with weapons. And so here we have an attempt to end the fighting that was never implemented. And so the 
war you have to think of is not just starting on February 24th of last year, but really this is the ninth year of that war. And the question we have to ask is where is this heading? What is victory according to the different sides? Well, you know, we don't know. At one point, there was an attempt to negotiate right after the, 20, uh, the February 24th invasion. And the <clears throat> sociological research always shows that if you can have peace negotiations within the first month of a conflict, that's the time when you have the most chance of coming to a negotiated settlement. And indeed, there were countries all over the world who tried to get involved and negotiate a settlement. It was Italy, it was Israel, it was uh, Turkey, the United Nations, and they started brokering talks. And one of the talks was happening in Turkey. And these talks were happening at the end of March, the beginning of April, and they were actually getting somewhere they were starting to have agreements. And one of the agreements was that Ukraine would not join NATO. It would be a neutral country. Very, very, very essential part of any agreement. And Zelensky went to his people and talked about it and said, it looks like our dream of, of, of entering NATO will not be possible, but if we're a neutral country that has guarantees by strong outside nations, we can live with that. And as the negotiations were progressing, lo and behold, the head of the UK at that time, Boris Johnson, appeared, talked to Zelensky and said, we don't want you to negotiate. We want you to win. And we, the collective West, will be there with you until victory. And then the head of the US Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, showed up. And he said, we have to weaken Russia so that it will not be able to do this again. Lo and behold, the talks were broken off. Now, some people say, oh, it was the Russians, oh, it was this, it was that. But guess what? We have officials in Turkey that are saying that. We have it reported in a very respectable anti-Russian newspaper in Ukraine. We have Ukrainian officials talking about it. And just recently, we have the person who was the head of state in Israel at the time, Neftali Bennett, who was also trying to negotiate. And he was going back and forth between Kyiv and Moscow. And guess what he said? He said things were going well. There was a desire on both sides to get to a ceasefire. And then the West blocked the agreement. Now, that's not coming from somebody who doesn't like the West. It's coming from the prime minister of Israel at that time. So we see that negotiations have been torpedoed by the US and by NATO. And we see the Ukrainian people suffering as a result day after day after day. At the time of those negotiations, as I said, Zelensky was willing to not join NATO, to rethink the Donbass in light of the Minsk agreements and autonomy within NATO, and to put off the issue of Crimea for 10 to 15 years down the road. But now when the West came in and said no, his position has totally changed. His position now is victory means clawing back every inch of territory in the Donbass and getting back Crimea. The meanwhile, the Russians have also taken their maximalist position by having sham referenda in four of the provinces that they say they control when they don't control them all, and saying that these are now part of Russia. And so you have the two sides that are farther apart. But we have to look at that as a negotiating position. Because, you know, you negotiate from saying what you really want, and then you start making compromises. 
Well, I hear over and over and over again, you can't negotiate with Putin. Putin is a madman. Putin wants to reconstruct the glory days of the Soviet Union. You cannot trust them. And my answer to that is, that is what we have. That is what exists. Putin, like it or not, is the head of Russia. And peace talks are done with your adversaries. You say you can't talk to Putin, I say try. And tell us what happens. Tell us what the result is. Because you know what? Biden has not picked up the phone in over a year to talk to Putin. And our Secretary of State, who's supposed to be the number one diplomat in the United States, Anthony Blinken, only had one phone conversation with his counterpart, Lavrov, in this whole last year. It was not how to stop the war. It was how to get Brittany Griner back from being a political prisoner back to the United States. And that was successful. And Lavrov just had his first face-to-face -face meeting with Blinken on the sidelines of the G20 summit that just took place. And guess how long that meeting was? 10 minutes, exactly, 10 minutes. Now we laugh at that. It is pathetic, pathetic. 10 minutes and then he appeared before a press conference to say, I told him that the, you know, the, the, the way to solve this is for the Russian troops to leave. He has not been doing his job. In fact, what he has been doing is going around the world trying to gin up more weapons for Ukraine. We don't have a diplomat in the State Department that is capable of doing what is needed right now. And when you say that you can't talk, that Russia and Ukraine can't talk to each other, guess what? They are talking all the time. They talk about the grain deal that has to be renewed every three or four months that is a very complicated negotiation about how to get tens of millions of tons of grain out of Ukraine to countries around the world that are desperate for that grain. There are talks ongoing about getting the International Atomic Energy Association inspectors into those nuclear plants so they won't blow up. There are talks constantly about prisoner swaps, and they're happening all the time, at least once a month that is very, very complicated talks to take place. There are talks about getting the bodies of fallen soldiers back to their families. There are constant talks that are happening, but of course they're not happening about how to stop the war. And that's what we have to move towards. And that's where we all come in. Because while well, I said that Biden is not doing his job and Blinken is not doing his job, and they're hiding behind this facade of nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, we can't tell the Ukrainians when to talk. Well, guess what? Who is paying for this war? Who is paying for the government of Ukraine to function? Including the pensions of people in Ukraine one day at a press conference Biden mentioned that, and I had a lot of friends who are not getting any pensions at all saying, well, wait, why are we paying for the pensions of Ukrainians when we're not getting pensions here in this country? The US has spent over $110 billion already on this war. And it's always just send in more of this kind of weapon or this kind of weapon and victory is around the corner. So it was the Patriot missiles and then it was the HIMARS and then it was the tanks and now it's the F-16. Guess what comes after that? Troops. Exactly, troops, exactly, which they're already talking about. And the US has tens of thousands of troops and is sending more troops to Europe. And while Biden says we're not gonna get troops involved, he has said we're not gonna get this weapon, we're not gonna do that weapon, and he keeps changing his mind because of pressure. Now, where is that pressure coming from? It's coming from all kinds of places. It's coming from the neocons who have taken control of our government. It's, they're, they're embedded in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party. They're the ones who got us into the disastrous war in Iraq. They're the ones who got us into the disastrous war in Afghanistan. They lose every single time, and yet they're still in power. Like Victoria Newland, whose husband, Robin Kagan, is one of the architects 
of the neocons. And it's the weapons industry that gained so much money from this war. You know, Biden just introduced his budget, 53% of discretionary funds going to the military, half of that going to the weapons, the, 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 the contractors for the Pentagon. This is huge profits for them. It's also huge profits for the energy companies because when the Russian energy was sanctioned, who jumped in to fill that void? The US oil and gas companies. We're seeing right now the US giving, uh, Biden is just about, or did he give the okay for that Willow project for yeah, yeah. new drilling? He did, right? Yeah. yeah. He did. He did. Today, I think. Yeah. This is just one example of what he has been doing since the, uh, uh, the last year of this war, which is giving out new permits. I was just in Texas at the Gulf Coast, where they have been fighting and fighting the gas companies, the oil companies, and they said, everything we've been doing has just gone up in smoke because now we have the excuse. We have to help our brothers and sisters in Europe who are suffering from the high oil prices because of the sanctions on Russia. The oil companies have had the biggest profits they've ever had in their history. So we have the dirty energy companies that are benefiting. We have the weapons companies that are benefiting. And guess what? Who is poised to really make out like bandits? The banks, the financial companies, and the companies that are going to be involved in the rebuilding of Ukraine. That is, if we don't have a nuclear war and there's nothing to rebuild. But the largest financial firm in the United States, does anybody know what it is? BlackRock. Has already signed a memorandum of understanding with Zelensky about financing the rebuilding of Ukraine. So there are so many companies that make money by destroying Ukraine, and then they're going to make money by rebuilding Ukraine. But we're supposed to live in a democracy. And the people who uh, are in Congress are supposed to represent us. Now, some of us snicker about that because we know how hard it is to get them to do their job. But you know what? We have to push them because that is what we have. Congress holds the purse strings. Congress is authorizing tens and tens of billions of dollars to keep this war going. So we have a very strange political situation right now. Um, if you think that normally progressive Democrats in Congress would be wet, less warlike, because they're the ones that year after year say, oh, we should cut the Pentagon budget by 100 billion, something like that, never passes. Um, they are not with us today. 30 of the progressive Democrats signed a letter to Biden back in October saying that, they didn't say let's cut off weapons. They said, in addition to all that we are doing to help Ukraine militarily and economically, we should start negotiations. Well, all hell broke loose when they put out that letter. And within 24 hours, they were bombarded with by their own party to say, how dare you put this out before the election and make us look like we're divided on national security issues. You have to withdraw that letter. And lo and behold, that's what they did within 24 hours. They withdrew that letter. And they have been so afraid since then to say anything about negotiations. It is just remarkable. It's craziness. And in the meantime, who are the ones in Congress that are talking about negotiations and questioning the blank check for Ukraine? Right. Who? Right. The extreme right. right. The Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Dumbarts. Matt Getz, <laughs> they are the ones. In fact, Matt Getz put out a, a resolution just recently calling for an end to the money to Ukraine and for negotiations. He's got 15 Republicans signed on, small, small number of them. Not a Democrat would touch it. And yet, that is the rational position. So we have been going through the halls of Congress and traveling around saying to people, 
No matter who your congressperson is at this point, we have got to talk sense into them. And guess what? The polls show more and more the American people are taking a position that says negotiations and taking a position that says we don't want to send more weapons into what people are understanding is an unwinnable war. They have heard the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, say, uh-oh, it looks like a stalemate, time to negotiate. They understand from the past disastrous experiences the U.S. has been in that, that when we're told that victory is around the corner, mm, question that one. We were told that for 20 years in Afghanistan, and then we left and the Taliban are back in, in power. The last AP poll showed that 48% of the American people don't want to continue sending weapons to Ukraine. That is quite remarkable given what we started out talking about, which is the bombardment of the mass media around this issue. So we have, on the one hand, American people who are starting more and more to be on the side of negotiations, and yet you have the Congress that is very much in the hands of the military, industrial, congressional, what, what does uh, Ray McGovern call it, the Mickey Mat, because he puts in the think tanks and all of the uh, other entities that are part of this complex. Uh, and so Congress is not representing the best interests of the American people. And that's why we have to be pushing and pushing and pushing them. And then in terms of the White House, I think there is a lot of division in the White House on where to go in this. And there are cooler heads in the White House that are very, very, very concerned about where this is all going. So who is putting out peace plans now? It's very interesting. Did anybody hear about the Chinese peace plan? So the Chinese just put out a 12-point peace plan. And I wanted to read you, because of the physical site we are now, now on, just what they said on the nuclear weapons issue, which is number eight is nuclear weapons must not be used. Nuclear wars must not be fought. The threat or use of nuclear weapons must be opposed. Nuclear prol proliferation must be prevented. And nuclear crisis avoided. We oppose the research, development, and use of uh, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons by any country under any circumstances. Yeah. How did the US respond to the Chinese peace proposal? Said it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous to think that China could be in a position to put forward any, uh, yes, it's a, a peace proposal. Um, and they just did it with Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, I have been working for years against the governments of Iran and Saudi Arabia. But I am so happy that China stepped in and found a way for them to have, to normalize relations between each other. Quite remarkable, the US sends weapons, billions and billions of weapons to Saudi Arabia so they could keep a war going in Ukraine, devastating the, some of the poorest people in the world. And the US pulled out of a nuclear agreement with Iran, causing a huge crisis in the region. And who steps in to make peace? China. But who does the US see as its main adversary in the world? China. In fact, what they're saying is we have to weaken Russia. Why? Weaken Russia so that it will not be a strong ally to China. That is what the people in this government and this military are talking about. A war with China. So where are we going and how can we stop this? So my, I want to end before we come into questions on a more hopeful note. One is the American people starting to question more and more this war. The other is the people in Europe more and more starting to question this war because they are feeling the blowback from the sanctions with the higher energy prices. 
and the people in the global community that are desperate to see an end to this war because it's affecting their standard of living with the higher costs of food and energy, and because the West is pressuring them to take sides. And while we say at the United Nations, these votes, we say 141 nations are on our side, do you know what? It doesn't represent the majority of people in this world. If you take the countries that are represented by the majority of people in this world, they have been pretty determined to say, there is only one side we want to take in this, and that is the side of peace. And so I want to end by having a quote from one of the real representatives of the Global South who came up to meet with Biden just a couple of weeks ago, and that is President Lula from Brazil. He had been pressured by the United States to send weapons to Ukraine. He said, we don't need to send more weapons to Ukraine. What we need is interlocutors who will talk to the Russians and tell them what a terrible mistake they made by invading Ukraine. And we need to talk to the Ukrainians to tell them how important it is that they go to the peace table. He said, we don't want to join this war. We want to end this war. So let's be with Lula, the people in the global south, the people all over Europe, and the growing majority in the US that says we don't want to join this war. We want to end this war. Yes. Thank you. Yes, so we have some time for a discussion here. You know, just, just reading, uh, Chris Hedges was talking about this Ukraine war as a proxy war, uh, that the real purpose is to weaken Russia. Do you think it's actually going to weaken Russia, or how is it really going to change things, or it will actually end up strengthening Russia? I mean, it's not really clear how this is going to play out. I think this is a lose-lose situation for everybody. I think it's a lose situation for Russia. Uh, while the sanctions have not had the impact that the West wanted them to have, um, as time goes by, they're having more and more of an impact. We already know that hundreds of thousands of young men have fled, fled the country because they don't want to fight. We know that there's increased censorship and repression inside of Russia, which is bad for the Russian people. Um, you know, it's strengthening authoritarianism in Russia as wars do. They strengthen the hardliners. And that's a bad thing for Russia. That's a bad thing for the Russian people. It's a bad thing for the whole world. On the other hand, I think what Chris um, is, is probably mentioning is how it's shifting geopolitics around the whole world. And Russia is now closer to China. And there are all these countries in the global south, Africa, Latin America, that are looking at alternatives to the US sphere and trying to find financial alternatives. And that is happening more and more as they're doing trade in energy uh, through uh, by avoiding the dollar. And it's part of the decline of the US empire. So in a sense, um, that is happening uh, while this war is going on. But let's not kid ourselves. Um, in war, the vast majority of people are the losers. Thank you for your presentation. One thing that concerns me now uh, is that Saudi Arabia is asking for more assistance to build their civilian nuclear power, which anybody knows is going to be turned into nuclear weapons. So what can we do as a global community to make sure that Saudi Arabia doesn't get their hands on nuclear weapons? Well, one thing would be to get back into the Iran nuclear deal, because the Saudis' you know, excuse is that their enemy, Iran, uh, is getting nuclear weapons. That's why it's such a positive thing that China stepped in to try to improve relations between the two, and that can help ease the tensions in Saudi Arabia. Um, but yes, I mean, we certainly don't want to be 
uh, supporting Saudi Arabia in its nuclear energy. And it's ridiculous. The country that's the number one producer of oil uh, would need nuclear power. Um, but I think that um, this is a larger question about the US uh, role with Saudi Arabia. You know, here we have uh, the overarching theme that our government is giving about why it's so essential to support Ukraine because we support democracies against authoritarianism. And one of the most repressive governments in the entire world is the Saudi government. They just gave 40 year sentences to people for tweeting. I mean, they are incredibly repressive. And we have been flooding that country with weapons uh, since, uh, well, Obama's time. So uh, I don't think we want to do anything that could uh, help Saudi Arabia um, get the kind of material and know how it needs to develop a nuclear weapon. We get the impression here in the United States that the Ukrainian people are all in on this war and that they are willing and eager to fight to the death. Is that true? Well, I think there are a lot of Ukrainians who are all in. And you know, as the sides get, uh, as more and more of your loved ones get killed, you don't want them to be killed in vain. And so it's natural. It's more like, OK, you know, now we've really got to win. We've really got to win. And especially since uh, the West and the government is telling them that victory is possible. But of course, there are Ukrainians, let's remember, there are Ukrainians in the Donbass and Crimea, um, <clears throat> many of whom want to be uh, associated with Russia. And there are many Ukrainians who are getting tired of this war. And so polls that have been taken show that it's actually in the areas where they have the least fighting happening, that they are the most, most gung-ho about continuing this war. And the areas where people are really suffering are the ones who are more amenable to finding a negotiated solution. Up front, uh, Ramona. Well, the Ukrainians who want this war, why do they want it? Well, they feel that they have been uh, invaded by a foreign force, that they have to uh, uh, defend their country, uh, that they are fighting an existential threat of Russia. Uh, and Russia uh, did not just go in to protect the Donbass and Crimea. Russia's invasion tried to get to Kyiv. And so for the people of Ukraine, that was uh, telling them that they wanted to install a pro-Russian government. And there are many people in Ukraine who are much more interested in being part of Europe than being part of Russia. And in fact, what is now being talked about as part of the solution is to really fast track Ukraine to be part of the European Union. So not part of NATO, but part of the European Union. Um, they certainly feel, a lot of Ukrainians, that that's where their future lies. What if they had um, gone ahead and said, you know, that uh, the, U the uh, <coughs> Ukraine will not never be part of NATO? What would the, how would the Ukrainian people have responded to that idea? Well, that's a very important question. And I think um, because Zelensky is such a brilliant communicator, uh, he could communicate that. And that is what he was communicating early on. And he said that anything that, was, that he came up with, he would give the people a chance to vote on it. And so he would have to do a good sales job. And there would be, have to be a lot of things in there that the Ukrainian people could say, well, we won this, and we won this, and we won this. Um, but I think uh, this idea that if you join the European Union, which is you know, economically very advantageous. And if you had the backing of powerful countries that Ukraine would not be invaded again, and you had a commitment by the part of the West um, that there would be money for re rebuilding Ukraine, uh, I think there would be a lot of Ukrainians who would see that as much better than the alternative of keeping the war going. What would you suggest for the average person to try and encourage uh, the forces that be to bring about negotiations? Well, I think that we have to kind of go back to the basics. I mean, one is education. You know, I, I didn't write this book to get rich. <laughs> Don't make money on these books. You basically lose money. Um, but it's a good primer. It's an easy read. 
And it's good to read and pass on and pass on and pass on. And I've had people who bought you know, dozens of copies and put them in libraries and getting them out to universities. Education, education, education is really important. And the 18 minute video that we have is also a good primer and we make that available. It's free online and we've been showing it in lots of universities. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and the other is contacting our Congress people and the White House. You know, it's so funny, as rich as this country is, uh, do you know that there is not a 24 hour hotline to call the White, White House, not a comment line? There used to be. There used to be. Trump reduced it and now Biden has not increased it. And so it's only three days a week. <laughs> it's only Tuesday and it's, and it's staffed by volunteers. <laughs> One F-16 and we could like pay massive number of people to do this for the rest of their lives. Um, it's only Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and it's only 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. <laughs> East Coast time. <laughs> so that's the time that you can call. Uh, and, uh, and it is important to call. And then it's also important to have a relationship with your um, with your. A representative. I was at a, a conference this weekend and I asked a room full of about 200 people, how many of you have ever had a face-to-face -face meeting with your congressperson? And there were five people in the whole room. And these are activists. You have had. Oh, yeah. How many people here have had face-to-face? -face? All right. Well, this is a very special grouping. So, you know, you have to go back to those face-to-face -face meetings. You have to go back to that kind of pressure and say to them, you know, you're a smart person. Huh? Make him feel good. Um, the only rational answer to this is negotiations. And, and, it, and Ukraine is not going to get in a better position as time goes by. It's going to get in a worse position. And so we need you to come out and say negotiations. You know, whether they're Republican or Democrat, it's funny, at this point, it doesn't matter. You might be more likely with the Republican to get a response than with the Democrat. You know that Trump is really taking advantage of this. And he is saying in his stops and his speeches, you get the Democrats, what do you get war? Get me in. And before I even, in, in the White House, if you vote for me and I win, I will solve this war because I have a good relationship with Zelensky and with Putin and I would pick up the phone and we would all talk and we would solve these problems. And he gets massive applause for that. So, you know, we've got to tell, if it's Democrats, tell them that this is going to be more and more labeled as their war. And if it drags on and drags on towards presidential elections, it's going to come back to bite them. So uh, we've got to get a message loud and clear to our representatives that they have to take, they have to come out with a public statement that they're in favor of negotiations. And if they don't like this resolution that Matt gets put forward, and I actually don't like the resolution because it cuts off all money to Ukraine, and that would mean even humanitarian aid, and I don't think that that's right. But then it'd say to them, well then put forth your letter. What would you like? Put it down and let us see it and let us help you get other members of Congress to go for that as well. Give us something. And when we were in Congress and asking, well, you know, I don't want to do that, I said, well, then just put out a damn tweet. You know, whatever it is, something that says you're in favor of negotiations, that will help us with the building, 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 because they are so afraid in Congress to come out with this normal, rational position that they have to hear from us. And the, some of the Republicans who voted against the $40 billion in, in aid to Ukraine, when they were asked why, they said they were hearing pressure from their base. So that's what we have to do. So whether you know about people in Ukraine and that overseas in a now violent way war, uh, what is the difference in the foreign policy of this country right like that before from all the story? And um, how do you see we could like a humanity get rid of people nuclear weapons? So in the terms of resistance, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, when the Re Russians first invaded, there was just a flowering of nonviolent resistance, all kinds of examples of non-cooperation uh, with the Russians. And at that time, 
uh, the Ukrainians were asking for help and support in that nonviolent resistance. And instead, we went in the opposite way, which is in the way of militarism. And we have a lot of friends in Ukraine who are conscientious objectors. And you know there is forced conscription now. So they have had to flee the country as well. Some of them are in jail because of their objection to war. Uh, and so there is a large international community that is helping both the Russian conscientious objectors and the Ukrainians. And I think that's very, very important to do. Uh, in terms of how we stop nuclear weapons, you know, it is the law of the land because there is a nuclear ban treaty that so many people around the world have so, uh, worked so hard to implement. And now I think it's 96 countries that have signed that. Uh, and uh, the job now is how do we get the rest of the countries and, of course, the countries that have nuclear weapons to sign that. And if there's a tiny, tiny silver lying in this terrible, brutal, horrific war, it is that people are becoming more aware of the threat of nuclear weapons. When I go and talk in colleges, um, uh, people have very, very little experience in nuclear weapons, what would nuclear winter look like? You know, I tell them if you're environmentalists, you have to hate nuclear weapons because, you know, nuclear winter would mean that there would be no crops being, being uh, grown, that there would be star mass starvation. Uh, and, um, and so I think that uh, this is an opportunity for more people to understand that nuclear deterrence doesn't work. I mean, that we are now facing, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, 90 seconds to midnight, the most dangerous, catastrophic moment in our history. And that this uh, ban treaty is looking more and more critical for the future of life on this planet. So the people, I'm sure there are people here who are involved in, in pushing the, 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 uh, the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, but I find it exciting all over the country that people are passing local resolutions, uh, now trying to pass statewide resolutions, and having it be this groundswell of support from the bottom up. Um, yeah, thank you, Medea. I am um, I'm excited about the um, prospect that you say negotiations will draw forward that uh, Ukraine might become a neutral country. And um, I'm just, of course, uh, many people talk about the, the threat of fascism and how Russia is uh, looking a lot like Germany did during World War II and starting with Ukraine and then probably you know, expanding from there. Is there uh, some kind of history we can point to that, that shows that uh, when a country says, well, we're going to be neutral, that it actually uh, provides a deterrent to the you know, colonial fascist uh, approach to taking over the world kind of thing that, that they say you're, that's what Russia's doing? Yeah, I think Austria is a great example. And Austria has um, thrived as a neutral country. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very exciting because um, we have been in touch with groups in, in Austria who've shown that their history, it's been so important for them um, to maintain this neutrality, but there's a lot of pressure on them uh, to join NATO, just like we see Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Uh, and of course, Switzerland is an, another example of a neutral country. Um, but what I am um, very excited about in terms of, uh, of Austria is that it has a history of being a place that has brokered peace deals. And we are organizing a global gathering in Austria uh, this summer on June 10th uh, and inviting people from all over, and it will be people from all over Europe particularly who will be coming um, to have a global call to end this war in Ukraine. And we will then be taking that global call to uh, to Kyiv, to Moscow, and to the governments of the uh, European countries as well. Um, you know, there is growing fascism all over the world, and we have it right here in this country. And it is very, very worrisome. And as we were talking earlier, how war brings out the worst in people, and it really strengthens uh, authoritarian figures, it strengthens nationalist sentiments, uh, and it's something that we have to worry about when people say, we've got to get rid of Putin. 
Others say, beware of what you ask for. I was just listening to a debate of four very um, key experts on this issue in Europe, and two of them were in favor of continuing the war in Ukraine, and two of them were opposed. All four of them agreed that if Putin were to be overthrown, someone worse would come in. So let's not think that that is the silver, the key, you know, bullet to this, that it, it's, um, uh, that you're gonna get something better. Uh, the best way to fight fascism is to uh, end the wars. Uh, the best way to fight fascism is to have a mobilized citizenry um, that is mobilized around the real needs of people. And that's why I find it exciting in Europe when I see some of these groups where very conservative governments have come to power, like in Italy, um, George Maloney is very uh, tied into the fascist groups in Italy. And she has been convinced, if, but if first uh, talking about not getting involved in Ukraine, now they're sending weapons to Ukraine. And the people in Italy have been the most mobilized of all the Europeans because they understand fascism. And they understand um, that this is a critical moment for them uh, especially with the government they have in power now. And they have to build up just the opposite, which is get the trade union movements, the religious movements, um, get the traditional peace groups out in the streets. And they're going out by the tens of thousands and they had protests uh, on the anniversary of the war in over a hundred cities in Italy. So I think it's a good example of how people power from a place of um, peace and love uh, can uh, come in at a key moment to try to uh, stop the growth of fascism. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Nadia. We're, again, we're just so honored to have you here. Uh, now we're going to hear from Tom Rogers. Um, many of you may know him. He's, he's going to give us a, a, a few minutes about, uh, about the, the base on the other side of the fence, just so that we know. It's part of our education component. Uh, so he's just kind of agenda check. He's gonna talk about five minutes, and then we'll, uh, we could use a few volunteers maybe to help with tables. But then we're going to have uh, have some have some lunch, and then later we'll walk down to the base. So, anybody willing to help set up tables? A few? Okay, all good. Thank you. All right, Tom. Kathy, um, yeah. when we start lunch, I'm asking the peacekeepers to uh, meet out on the front porch for just a couple minutes. Okay. Thank you. We got that covered. Perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, Kathy, may I ask? Sure. Oh yeah. Okay. Sit here. Okay. I forgot my clicker. Okay. So. You want to just uh, give me a five? Hi everybody, uh, who's been uh, on the base? Who's been in the middle of the base? Oh, couples, yeah, all right. I see Mona because she worked there for years. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's my friend. Uh, I spent uh, 32 years uh, in the Navy, and some of it was uh, on the Bangor base, um, and so I, I, I know the way around. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, of course, uh, this beautiful place is where it all begins uh, for us. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, just a Google uh, Earth uh, overview of the base. North is to the right. Uh, next slide. And uh, ground zero is uh, in the lower left uh, in the yellow circle. Can you say what ground zero means? Oh. The ground zero center for nonviolent action. And ground zero is a word or term that was coined in 1946 in the Encyclopedia Britannica as the aim point of a nuclear weapon. Period, end of story. 
They, uh, got, that thing in, that happened in New York had nothing to do with nuclear <laughs> weapons, and they took the term Ground Zero. So when you say, I'm from Ground Zero around here, they say, oh, are you from New York? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we are on Clear Creek Road right here, and of course the fence is here. Uh, next slide. When we uh, this, uh, are ready to go down for our vigil, we're gonna go out to the road, uh, all gather at the bottom of the south driveway and walk across the road uh, together. It's a 50 mile an hour uh, road, so we need to be organized about the way that we get down there. It's about a half mile walk, um, but we will, uh, move across the road together, and then walk in single file uh, down the left side uh, of the road toward the base. So we'll be coming down here, and when we get to this point, oh, uh, and uh, Mac is waving uh, yellow uh, jackets. There'll be a couple of people uh, who are called peacekeepers, uh, and some of them can spell and some can't. But, um, <laughs> The misspelled ones are highly proud. <laughs> uh, so they'll be leading us uh, down uh, to the base uh, and uh, being in charge of crossing the road safely and, and that sort of thing. So when we get down here, we're all going to gather again on the left side of the road and move over to the right side together. And then uh, this line here is a path that goes uh, down to the gate. Um, this is an overpass. You can't get from Clear Creek Road uh, to the gate, uh, so that's why we have to take the path. Uh, Which is real wet and slippery. The path is a little bit steep and rocky and wet and slippery. So if you're not feeling good about that, uh, talk to Mary and uh, Carolee uh, about uh, riding down. And um, what will we are able to, uh, we have cooperation from the state patrol um, that we can park our vehicles on, uh, on this road under the uh, overpass for the time that we're visualing. We do have a good relationship with local law enforcement and uh, Navy security. There will be some Navy security folks there. They know we're coming. Uh, it's the way we operate. Next slide. So uh, back to the overview, this is where the Dragon submarines are. Next slide. Yeah, it's called the Delta Pier because it's shaped like a delta. Uh, you can see there's three submarines alongside and there's also a dry dock. Uh, next. And uh, this is what a Triton looks like. Uh, it just kind of looks like a regular submarine. And, you know, they're about that big. The size of this submarine, next slide please, is if you put the stern of the submarine on Clear Creek Road, the bow of the submarine is over the fence. It's 560 feet long. From the keel to the top of the sail is 75 feet. That's a seven story building. These things are, are just incredibly large, massive, and have been described by uh, naval officers as national treasures. <laughs> um, and, and we need to get rid of them. Yeah. And not replace them right. with the, the new uh, Columbia class. Next slide. And uh, while I'm at it, okay, there are uh, 20 missiles on board. It used to be 24. Uh, four uh, tubes were disabled uh, as a new start requirement, and uh, they're currently carrying about 90 uh, warheads um, and have capacity to carry three times that, uh, but uh, the 90 is, a, again, a limitation of the new start. Next slide, please. Where are the warheads? The warheads are 1.4 miles from our fence in this area. 
Uh, next slide, which is the Strategic Weapons Facility Pacific. Uh, it's a very high security area with, um, I was told that, uh, if you recall, in 2009, uh, two priests, a nun, two grandmothers uh, broke into the base and got into the Strategic Weapons Facility Pacific. It was a plowshares action. The response to that was $1.2 billion in security upgrades to keep the grandmothers and the nuns and the priests out of Strategic Weapons Facility Pacific. $1.2 billion! Can you get your head around that? Okay. Um, next slide. Uh, this is uh, where the uh, warheads go. Next slide. And it's uh, it's brand new. Uh, this was just built in 2015. The warheads used to be dispersed in bunkers all over Swiftpack. You saw bunkers in the previous slide. Now they all come and go from this uh, one underground bunker that has a capacity of about 1,200 warheads. And the, uh, the armored vehicles uh, come in here, they go down into the bowels of the earth, they transfer the warheads uh, to uh, environmentally controlled secure areas, and then they drive back out the other side. Yeah. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is uh, just from the uh, bulletin of the atomic scientists, uh, 2023 uh, update. Uh, this is what is there today. As you see, the U.S. and Russia control over 90% of the nuclear warheads in the world. Not to mention the proxy warheads in uh, the U.K. Uh, but um, now this is Rogers talking. The only way that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons will finally reach fruition is to renegotiate New START to reduce these numbers so that they look like these numbers. Until the US and Russia agree on a plan to finally disarm there is no incentive for the rest of the world to do the same thing. Um, also, just a recent update uh, I read uh, in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, uh, Hans Christensen credits China with having 100 launchers that can reach the U.S., and the U.S. is also defined as Guam and Hawaii. To reach the continental U.S. is even fewer. So, People who say uh, China is building up for a massive nuclear attack on the United States, that is just bunk. It's ridiculous. Next slide. That's it. Um, are you going to give me time for one or two questions? Uh, sure, sure. What? Thank you, Tom. Tom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You pointed to the uh, warhead on the Friday submarine. What is the kilo of, of those warheads? How does it compare? How does it compare to the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? There are two, uh, actually three warheads that are carried uh, on Trident. Uh, the W76-1 is 90 kiloton. The W88 is 475 kiloton, and the Hiroshima bomb uh, was about 10 to 12 kilotons. So these are massively destructive thermonuclear weapons that are not in the same class as uh, the only bomb that was ever used uh, against people. So uh, yeah, it, it's a it's, it's, I don't even like to do that comparison because they're just so horrible, you, you can't convey the destructive power. Thank you.
I I was just following up and said there's ninety of these gigantic things on each submarine. Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. On average. Oh, I, and I forgot to mention, there's about 600 reserve warheads there in that bunker uh, at Swiftback. That is called the strategic reserve. And if New Start is, is canceled, you know, it's been suspended by the Russian side, if it fails, every one of those quote, reserve warheads, of which there are a thousand uh, that are divided between Kings Bay and here, there is ample space on the missiles, on the submarines today, to upload every one of those weapons in a matter of a week. So that's part of the problem when you look back at, at, at the numbers of, we of warheads yeah, there's only 1,500 deployed, but there's 5,000 total. Hank had a question. Yeah, Hank, I think this is the last question. Tom will be around to just take questions afterwards during lunch and stuff, because we've got a pretty tight schedule, I'm afraid, because we have to get Medea on to the next, on to our next location. So go ahead, Hank, and then, and then we'll get organized for lunch. Probably a silly question, but what's the, the radiation output from this facility, both officially and in reality, about zero. You, you believe that? I did. Okay. I lived there. I you know, I spent my whole life there. It, yeah. Okay. Uh, the, now, you know, if something blows up, then that's a different story. But today, right now, at this moment, it's near zero. Okay. Let's have 